Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us tonight here at the New Carrollton branch of Prince George's County Memorial Library System. My name is Randall Harris. I work at Spalding's branch in District Heights. Um, I'm here with uh, the, the great Edith <laughs> Johnson Gilmore. Uh, give her, her, her a hand, please. <laughs> and our program tonight is centered around the Black Panther Party. Uh, as many of you may know, the Black Panther Party has had a significant impact on American culture, politics, economics, not only in America, but essentially around the world. And I thought this would be a great way to celebrate Black History Month by sort of capstoning it with a, having a conversation with somebody who was in the Black Panther Party. Thank you. I want to welcome you all. I'm glad you're here, and I am delighted to share my story with you. <laughs> So Edith, let's take it back to the beginning uh, to sort of like um, get your full story. So uh, first off, where are you from? Where's your family from? We were originally from New Jersey and New York City New York in City? Harlem. Okay, that's awesome. Um, how would you categorize your childhood, you would say? My childhood was uh, the basic large family of 11. Uh, my father was a teacher. Yeah, he graduated from college in the late 40s and then was called to be a Baptist minister. So we grew up in the church, uh, not too strict. He was pretty liberal. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I have seven brothers. And oh, wow. so uh, all of us, uh, we had a pretty good childhood. Um, I'm assuming we were poor, fairly, but we didn't know it because the whole community uh, at that time uh, were like a big family. Everybody was connected, essentially. Exactly. One big family. Yes. Okay. And um, when I think about the Black Panther Party, I immediately think about the Civil Rights Movement, especially during that time. But as you talk about your family, um, I kind of wanted to know, um, were they involved in the Civil Rights Movement anyway? Yes. Um, like you said, uh, things were parallel at the time. Right. The protests were going on with the Vietnam War. We had a black nationalist movement going on all across the nation, not only in the West, but the South and the East and North. And so uh, the nation was in an uproar. <laughs> and there were many protests. Uh, most of them were not violent, but they were um, crying for a change. For a change. A change. It was time to make a change. Okay, and sort of contextualize that a little more. Like, what time period are we talking about specifically? Like so, it begins in 1970. Uh, at that time, uh, there was a large movement uh, for African American communities uh, to demand the equal rights that we were awarded. Uh, many college universities, many communities, uh, many families and organizations had come together to empower the black community. And therefore, uh, we wanted and expected change. We believed it was going to be a nationwide revolution. That is very, very impressive. And um, I guess we can get right into it. So at what age did you actually join Black Panther Party. It was in 1970. My junior year in high school, one of my brothers had just come back from the Vietnam War. Wow. He was 21 years old, uh, drafted at 19. So we were glad to see him home. Um, he sat and told my father stories about the atrocities of the war uh, to mankind. And uh, he was wanting to do something um, to let the nation know that this is something that young men, whether black or white, should not be participating in. So that junior year, he said to my dad, can I take Edie to California? Oh my goodness. And we went that very first summer of my junior year. We had little money. <laughs> we didn't know many people, but somehow he found the family that took us in for the summer. Wow, yes. that is incredible. Um, and when I think about that, about you just you joining your brother at the age of 16, you said? Yes. Um, what did your, uh, your parents think about that? 
my dad was for it. Oh, wow. <laughs> he knew that I had been previously uh, interested in a movement of sorts. Um, as a junior, I had an African-American teacher who encouraged me to not only learn U.S. history, but the history of my people. And because we didn't have internet or anything, then many of the articles and work he produced were from the newspapers. So I had already had an idea of what was going on in Oakland at the time. Uh, my brother uh, convinced my dad that, you know, it would be an experience for me. And so we went that first summer and uh, straight to Oakland <laughs> to the Black Panther chapter. <laughs> and I was immediately um, thrown into um, wonderful experiences, um, education. Uh, I was under the tutorship of Kathleen Cleaver. Oh, wow. Who had married her husband, Eldridge. Oh, and they were 19, 20 at the time. And so many of the Black Pampers were teenagers. We were very young. Uh, a great number were women. And so we had a lot of work to do. I accompanied them on rallies, uh, protests. They even, because it was legal in Oakland at the time to carry arms, once the party decided to take that action, we went to the downtown areas and actually walked up and down the street accompanying the Oakland police to make sure wow. that they were not uh, mistreating or abusing uh, anyone of color. And so they were armed and I accompanied them and it was exciting and empowering uh, to be a part of that. That is incredible. And that last point you said, which is really, really important when you think about uh, carrying arms in public. At the time, I believe Ronald Reagan was the, the governor, governor of that California. Is correct. And when these things became known to the public, like the, the famous picture that people may have seen. Yes, the from the Capitol the Steps. Capitol Steps, and he immediately revoked the law. That is correct. That. So I think it's also important to really think about how laws are different for other people when you actually put them into practice. Um, so you're joining the Panthers. Uh, you're young. You're excited. You're seeing all this energy. You're in exactly. Oakland, the home of the party with the Bobby Seals and the Huey P. Newtons of the yes. world. Um, what were some of the specific things that you were doing early on? So that second year of mm -hmm. high school, uh, from that experience that both my brother and I uh, really was excited about, he asked one more time, <laughs> can I go to Oakland with him? And we made the second trip and then immediately I joined the Black Panther Party. Um, we were, like I said, young, and mm -hmm. not only was it uh, pertaining to self-defense or equal rights, it was also they wanted to serve the black community. Right. And so I was a part of cooking in the basement of churches or using a kitchen in the civic center, even people's homes where we would cook hearty breakfasts, grits and eggs, and bacon mm. and turkey, <laughs> and then have it set up for the elementary schools and up into junior high. Uh, at some point it reached uh, over 20,000 breakfasts wow. that we were able to provide um, for the young black kids that were uh, attending school. Oh, wow. That is very, very impressive. From what I know is that was one of the first instances of that, of people actually providing free breakfast That's right. to kids in the inner city. And I believe you have a image of that is right yes, here. Yes, right? that is correct. It was uh, very important. Uh, and many of the communities uh, supported us, not only black, but white and part of the government who saw the need uh, for that breakfast to continue. And then at some point, um, we began to serve them in many facets. Uh, from car trunks to vans uh, at the time, we had uh, borrowed and purchased medical equipment. And we would go out to the communities and actually encourage them to let us take their blood pressure, 
or give them information about sugar diabetes, all of these things that very, uh, very attacked uh, prominently the black race as well as others. But it seemed to have been um, part of our DNA that we suffered from these uh, particular ailments. And so uh, that was a big hit. Um, many of them were lower class, some didn't have jobs. And so we provided free service uh, in the medical field for them. And um, it was a good, that was good. That is really, really impressive. Yeah. <laughs> And considering how impactful and how much the community really, really uh, appreciated what you guys were doing, on the other end, what was some of the pushback that you've gotten, that the group got for doing these things? Because it's not always uh, positive That's things That's correct. There, you know? <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, like one of those photos that went not only around the nation, but around the world of the Bobby and Huey being uh, armed, um, we were getting some negative uh, feedback um, about our position and what we felt about. They had actually developed a 10-point system that they borrowed uh, from the uh, continent of Africa and Asia where they had visited. Both of them were students at Merritt College and they were very intelligent and strong-willed uh, young men and they had a vision for the Panther. You're, you're talking about Bobby and... Bobby, Steel and Huey P. Newton. Newton. Exactly. That is impressive. Um, did you know either one of them, or did you ever come across those two I, at any point? Huey P. Newton. Oh, wow. Um, I actually uh, worked with him. Um, he was impressed about my writing, <laughs> and so I was able to uh, put some pamphlets together oh. for recruitment. And oh, we my. would go out into the streets and try to recruit young men and women who wanted to be a part of it. Uh, of course, we were teenagers, and like teenagers today, we wanted action like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and so we were uh, pushed and motivated and fearless when it came to uh, educating the young black youth on our history and purpose. Wow, that's really impressive. Um... Considering the kind of uh, impact that you had and how Hugh P. Newton really uh, loved your work, I did want to touch on something that I think is really, really important when we're talking about movements, is um, the gender uh, dynamics within the party. Uh, I wanted to know if you wanted to touch on that a bit. Yes, um, like I had said, there were quite a few women, mm -hmm. uh, young sisters uh, involved uh, in the Panther movement and um, our skills were very much needed. Uh, the fellas took more of a protective role uh, <laughs> <laughs> when it came to us, uh, you know, uh, going into the streets and uh, into the communities and the valleys of uh, San Diego and Oakland. And uh, because at the time still the, it was legal to have the arms, they took a more protective stand and it was the young women who performed uh, many of the duties. Um, we were responsible for uh, so much of the uh, information, the pamphlets, the banners, uh, working with the newspaper. Oh, wow, really important stuff. Yeah, you know, that was masses. our role. <laughs> that is very impressive. Um, so were these like the, the early to mid years you were doing these things? Yes, they were the early to mid years. And uh, though I stayed, uh, Quite a few months after I joined in my senior year, my dad said I had to come home. <laughs> and, oh, wow. and so my brother didn't return with me. He stayed. And so a friend drove me home. And I started classes at Rutgers University. Oh. And I was pretty busy with that and the student organizations. I was coming home pretty late. So one day my father was waiting at the door one evening and he said, you know, what are you doing? And so I sat and talked with him and he said to me, I'll never forget, if you're going to do something that you're committed at, then use the natural talent that you were given, which is literacy and service. Uh, from a little girl, my father would have me 
serving people at the church <laughs> conventions or <laughs> in elderly's homes or in the backyard picnics. They would put an apron on me and I was forever mm -hmm. serving someone. And so it became uh, part of my character, part of my mold. And he encouraged me to use that ability to um, participate in the Black Panther movement. And from that point, I started at the Harlem branch since it was closer to home. And then I did most of the rest of my work there at the New York City uh, chapter. Oh, wow, that is very impressive. Um, considering that you had to go all the way back to the East Coast, um, how did, did you keep in contact with people that you knew on the West yes, Coast at all? Yes, I did. We, uh, we kept in contact through letters through, they actually would send uh, to my home newspapers because we had developed a Black Panther newspaper, right. uh, I was able to keep up with everything that was going on. And uh, of course, Bobby and Huey both had come to New York. At that point in the late 70s, the Panther movement had spread throughout the all nation, over. all over, not just Oakland or San Diego. People were calling from North Carolina, Philadelphia, Chicago, oh, wow. New Jersey. They wanted to be a part of the movement. The young people thought it was important and they wanted to be committed. And so it was um, a lot of work to do, but um, I was able to uh, continue my work from the New York chapter. Oh, um, so how long did you stay uh, at the New York branch? Like how did that? For the close? rest of the duration, it mm -hmm. was about four years that I uh, stayed uh, in the Panther movement as a worker. Uh, my father, in his own right, was an activist of sorts. All right, <laughs> I wanted to get to that. Yeah. Yes, and so um, I knew um, how important it was to be committed, uh, to stay with what you were doing right. wholeheartedly. And so the remainder of my time as a Panther which I still am. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did at the New York chapter. The chapter. Um, and speaking on the still being a member, I kind of <laughs> want to get your take on what does the party look like now, do you think, um, in a macro sense? It's different. Different. It's very different. Um, I am aware of the so-called new uh, party of defense. I am familiar uh, with them, but there are quite a number of us left over from the original. Um, and we are committed to maintaining that status that we had, the purpose and the mission, uh, those 10 points that uh, they established very early on were not only something to learn or remember, but it was a way to live. Right. And so it incorporates into your very being, and there's no separating it <laughs> from yourself. <laughs> and so that stayed with me, and there are uh, some members that I am in contact, still in with. contact with. Yes, that still uh, inspire me, and, uh, and we do a little something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to, to wrap up, um, I wanted to get to this a little bit earlier, but like you said, the party, how it was originally in the new Black Panther Party came along, sort of in the middle of that, would you say that there was sort of like a, uh, like a fracturing, as you will? Because from what I understand that uh, Huey P. Newton, he had went to jail, unfortunately, and mm -hmm. things had gotten worse for him and then ultimately he was killed. That's um, correct. So how uh, would you characterize that period? So that period was um, frightening, to be honest. Um, by this time, the Panther Party had quite a lot of power. Um, they were said to be a threat to the government and to the nation. And unfortunately, uh, it resulted in many killings. Um, some of us, my people that I worked with and met, were killed off. Uh, innocent black lives um, 
presumably innocent, um, were taken away because of the threat um, that the nation and the government and the FBI had considered us, and they chose uh, opportunities to kill many of the Panthers off. And so it was a devastating period in that early 70s where so many of us had been killed. But um, there were so many young people. Um, they were hoping that the 16, 17-year-old group would come and sort of take the mantle uh, to continue on with uh, the mission that they had established. And that was our goal, and we were hoping uh, to do that. And unfortunately, the young man, little Bobby Hutton, as we call him, he, had, he was our first recruit, 16 years old. Smart. <laughs> uh, he was great. He did, in the two years that he lived as a Panther, he did uh, more for uh, the black community than some people in a lifetime. Um, he was um, true to the cause. And unfortunately, at some point, um, there was an altercation with the Oakland police. Um, right. It was suggested that you come out with your hands up and Bobby did so. He stripped down to his underwear and held his hands up on his knees. And unfortunately, they shot and killed him in that position. And so uh, many of the young Panthers were disheartened. They were not happy, of course, with that and um, sort of take a, a different kind of view. They weren't so much like the passive movement of MLK and other right. nationalists, they felt that the only way that we would get what we wanted and get it now was to have this armed revolution. And at the time of his death, um, there were many outbursts uh, throughout not only Oakland, but throughout the country. And then uh, the riots had come about uh, with uh, the devastation of Martin Luther King's assassination, and so uh, the movement took a turn, not for the better, because um, they were angry, very angry. And so uh, then violence began to be uh, a way for them to react, to let the world know that this is what we have to do, even to the point of sacrificing your life. Oh, that is really hard hitting um and the reason another reason why i brought up the fracturing too is as you mentioned with the fbi um that was a consorted effort you know by uh j edgar hoover correct and the cia to infiltrate and yeah. then destroy from the inside yes. so uh i just think it's really important to to note that because it's the main reason why a lot of things fell apart. Yeah. Yes, things began to uh, turn awry. Like I said, um, they put a lot of pressure on the young Panthers people. and uh, even to the point of uh, putting fear in the everyday lives of people that mothers and fathers who had young children or yeah. yes. And so, um, you know, you couldn't walk the street in the evening for fear that the Oakland police would shoot you uh, on the spot. And so um, the whole neighborhood was uh, like on a shutdown that we imposed on ourselves only for the protection of our families' lives. This is really, really, really impactful. Um, and I thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, this is really, really important. A lot of people are here to see. Um, I did want to know if anybody had any Questions? We want to open this up for a QA. and a um, Call your hand first, sir. How are you doing? Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, I think with Brother Malcolm, this is Rosa Parks, you know, they always make it seem like they came out of thin air, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Brother Malcolm, his parents were Garveyites. Uh, Ms. Rosa Parks, Mrs. Rosa Parks, she talked about, she thought about Emmett Till. You asked. You know, for most of you, what was it that sparked, if you could speak for yourself, or sure. definitely you could speak for yourself, but others, what was it that sparked you guys to step up, ladies? It was the, sure. 
Okay. Right. The gentleman um, asked, uh, he mentioned uh, at the times of what was going on with the Rosa Parks and the protests, the nonviolent movement, uh, even with Malcolm X, who was considered a nationalist uh, at the time. He wanted to know what sparked the Panthers to begin their movement. It, it was the enormous <laughs> atrocity of killings of young boys and men in Oakland. Uh, it had gotten to where it was a regular thing every three weeks, every week, every month. Some of the mothers who were crying out came to Huey and said, what are you going to do? There's no one to help us. And through that cry of black mothers whose sons had been murdered uh, innocently and on a regular basis, uh, Huey and them decided to start the Black Panther uh, movement, which was originally the defense party, because they wanted to protect the black community of uh, these useless killings that the Oakland police had been uh, placing upon the black communities. And then somebody had, had their hand up here? Okay, go ahead. I think we hear it all the time, like every generation says what the next generation, they don't understand. Right. They aren't as passionate as we do. Right. And hearing that the young, the Black Panther Party was so young, we might call yes. them babies. Yes. Right. Lives. Absolutely. Um, what are your thoughts on what, you know, someone you know, older could do to really ignite that way for people, you know, younger to be a part of something later? And, and vice versa, what can they do to kind of engage with the older? Right, that's an interesting question. And uh, just to mention about teenagers, uh, of course, we were fearless <laughs> and uh, excited. And so we had no thoughts about tomorrow or, or, or what we were going to do. We mm -hmm. just were uh, committed on that one factor of helping the black community. But um, as you get older, uh, it doesn't change the fact that you want to do something and that you're committed. Uh, of course, the times have changed where we are more uh, open to different avenues. We have the opportunity of education now <laughs> that was not available to us that much at the time. We have uh, places like this where we can meet and encourage young and old people to come and ask them what they think, and ask them what's important about uh, entering a community that, that they can support. Um, the young people, I think, are still ready and still are interested. And if we show them a little bit of the past, and because they are so bright today, uh, they probably have wonderful ideas of what we can do in the future. And then we always need the older ones that are can give them wisdom and guidance on um, what is acceptable in today's time. Thank you. And then, uh, yes. Just him? Okay, yeah. Hi. Could Hi. You, could you talk a little bit about the Panther 21, who they were, and what happened to them? Yes, the Panther 21, I remember them. I didn't have direct contact with them, but I am aware of their plight. Um, for whatever reason, they chose a little side view of what uh, Huey and Bobby had um, imagined for the Panther Party. They were strong in their commitment. Uh, their ideals were wonderful, but they weren't as accepted as the general Panther's view was. And I believe uh, that it didn't last very long that when they broke up, some of them even were imprisoned for doing illegal <laughs> things that were not acceptable in society. And so the, the uh, mass of the Panthers didn't want that. They didn't want to break any laws. They didn't want to do anything that would be harmful or, or against the, these 10-point views that they had, which was sticking together, empowering the community, learning your education, um, a style of life that was not only healthful mentally but spiritually and so the 21 group had veered a little uh, from that the essence of that mission and therefore they were sort of separated 
and unfortunately, uh, they were dismantled, and like I said, some of them had gone to prison. Mm -hmm. and, sir? I want to thank you very much for wearing your period. Yes, you know it is. You and I, you and I are sort of the same vintage, right? Right, that's right. I used to wear bell bottoms. That's right. But I grew up outside of Philly, mm -hmm. and I participated in rallies at various uh, colleges and right. And, and what was fascinating to me was how um, the war yes. was bringing together all disparate groups of people together. Yes. And you had different races all agreeing about right. different, things, different things. And they were coming together, right? Mm -hmm. And you used the term revolution, and you used the term movement. <laughs> right. That's what everybody thought about at the time. That's what and we now thought. Now you use those terms, you sort of think, well, that's what? crazy. <laughs> what kind of revolution are you Right. <laughs> but, I mean, how did you... In how long were you really active with the campus? I was active uh, a little over four years, wholeheartedly, busy, day and night. And uh, like you mentioned, uh, we didn't just think it was a movement. We were preparing for a revolution. We thought that the masses of black people would come together and we would demand the changes uh, socially, economically, uh, Business-wise, we wanted to empower every black community on one level with no questions asked and no other exceptions. That was what we believed was going to happen. We were preparing for that um, with the arms and practicing uh, to defend our families. We would go on outings two and three days with food just in case we had to run. <laughs> and uh, be safe. And so we were convinced that uh, this had to happen and should happen. And uh, that was our life. It was real. <laughs> uh, uh, you, sir, right. and then you. Yeah. You know, uh, Sheriff, would you, how do you feel or think about the condition of black people in the country? Hmm. Mm. That's some kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, just a short perspective, um, to be honest, I think we're still okay. I think we're still together. Um, but because the times have changed socially and economically, we're sort of branched out now. You know, we live where we couldn't live before. You can buy a home in, you know, buoy where maybe you couldn't 40 or 50 years ago. And at the time when I was growing up in the Panthers, the black communities were only in certain areas. So every black person lived in that community. And then in Chicago, every black person lived in the same black community. We weren't branched out like we are now. And so uh, we were able to know what's going on with each other, stick together, help the families. Uh, my dad was a preacher, like I said, but he was an activist in his own right. And I remember growing up, and, you know, people would be on my dad's porch, you know, can you give me a day's work so I can feed my family? Uh, or I would come home from my aunt's house, and there'd be two little girls in my sister's my bed. I was like, what the? Yeah. And my father would explain that their house was on fire, nine kids, everybody was separated, and he would take in uh, children so that we can help them until the parents were able to uh, get themselves together. Or, you know, the knocking on the door, four o'clock in the morning, a mother crying about her son uh, that was picked up by the police. My dad would go to the courthouse and the precinct and he would come home with their kid. And so the people wanted that connection. We needed that. There was no other help. Um, so the difference between then and now is a lot to do with how we are branched out in our communities, how we live, you know, pretty much wherever we want to, but they're not centered in one area. So it's not the community like it was uh, in the 1970s. You know, we have to call each other to get together or meet at a particular place. At that time, you just come out your front door, and there's everybody <laughs> that you knew. And so that changes the uh, demographic of, of community, 
I think. Uh, sir? Okay. My name is Ruben Scott. Hi. I'm a Black Panther. Nice to oh, meet huh? you. <laughs> I'm from the West Coast. Mm. I'm a little bit ahead of your time. I'm, I, I joined the Black Panther in 66. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was organized by one of Don Cox's cadres. Oh, yes. I am familiar with yeah. his name. Mm -hmm. uh, we were organized as kids in a study group. Wow. Our study group went from a bunch to those who were most uh, dedicated. Mm -hmm. We were organized as an urban guerrilla unit. Wow. This, you spoke up a little bit about the split in the party. Mm -hmm. The split in the party was between the Algiers faction mm -hmm. and the Oakland faction, mm -hmm. right. Oakland Berkeley faction. This split was basically between those who were for armed struggle and mm -hmm. those who were not. We're basically right. saying we weren't ready for arms. Right. Um, me, myself, I ended up in jail. Mm. I did do prison time. I did prison time because of the, the murder of George Jackson. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. The murder of George Jackson, we took revenge. I understand. For his murder. Mm. And uh, for that, I went to jail. Mm. Um, I did my time in jail. The people who I was in jail, who I did time with on my release, are just recently released after 50 wow. years in prison. Wow. 50 years in prison. 50 years. Herman Bell, Atiba, Cooley, they were the two that were just recently released in the last two years. I was wondering, did you have any information on them? The no. reason I can't relate to them is because I'm a convicted felon. I understand. They're convicted felon, and it's against the law for convicted to felons be in to contact. Each, to yes. Contact each no, I do not. Uh, uh, like I said, many of us uh, who are not in prison are either dead, but the few that is remaining that you're talking about, I have not been able or in contact with them. Uh, unfortunately, but I am aware of who they are. It was a little before, like you said, uh, before I came about with the, the second uh, generation of the Black Panther movement. So um, I didn't really um, know them personally. Mm -hmm. so thank you for sharing yeah, your thank story. Thank you for sharing your story. <laughs> okay, do we have any more questions or? Uh, one oh, more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Um, they have to discredit anything with any organization. Of course. You find, like, when things start to become, um, the wrong word to say popular, but when things are more in the forefront, mm -hmm. the women all of a sudden end up being pushed to the back. And so I'm curious if you experienced any of that. Do um, you have tips on how women can continue to let their light shine mm -hmm. um, when they're in these organizations? and yeah, you're all together, but there is still a gender. Dynamic. Of course. So, of I'm course. Just curious if you experience it and if you have any suggestions you know, for women. Fortunately, I have not uh, experienced that because of the uh, our job and our purpose with the Panther Party. We were very much needed and respected. I don't think they could have done it without us. But, uh, <laughs> but um, I am well aware of the uh, dynamics of gender in the you know, business world, uh, the politics, and all of that. But um, as you can see, step by step, we're making some pretty good progress. Uh, and so it's like onward and upward. I think it's important that we stay on that fight uh, as women uh, and our capabilities, uh, which are amazing. And it's uh, important that we continue to keep that mindset and don't worry about what the fellas think, you know, <laughs> we'll do all right. But yeah, I'm aware of the, that, uh, you know, type of attitude. But we were uh, very much needed um, for the Panther Party. Uh, and so we were appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you have My mouth is dropped open. Who knew this young lady is in crochet class with us? <laughs> 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 10 to 
12 on Thursday, spins and needles. <laughs> Bernie, Miss Bernie McCall got the ball rolling. <laughs> and who knew? Freedom Fighter. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, senior moment, I might have forgotten you, my <laughs> But I want to ask, is there one person's name that you can say for this part of the whole thing? And how was the group funded? Like I said, senior moment, maybe you mentioned already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, of course, the co-chair uh, were Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale. Bobby Seale. They were the two uh, African-American men from Merritt College who formed the Black Panther defense party at the time. Uh, there were women I had mentioned, um, Elaine uh, and Eldridge Cleaver, and uh, those were the co-chairs, you know, right from the beginning, uh, yeah. the basis of the program. And then it branched out to, uh, you know, Stokely Carmichael. There are many uh, people who uh, participated and were fundamental um, in the uh, formation of the Panther Party and the black movement. Uh, Carmichael always said, uh, it's time to put to sleep uh, the term Negro. <laughs> and he came up with black people, black consciousness. It was even in our arts, in our literature, in our music. James Brown would say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Or uh, <laughs> Marvin Gaye with what's going on? You know, talking about the times in the Vietnam War. So it was in everything that we did. And it showed um, there were much support and many people um, who uh, helped us along the way. Funding. The funding was um, mostly uh, businesses who were um, interested in our cause and believed in it. There were even some government um, uh, status that we had for some of the programs, the breakfasts and the medical um, needs. They were given to us by of the state and some of the um, federal available um, monies that we have for those programs. And then a lot of it were just poor people giving what they had. <laughs> You're welcome, Hi, it's my cousin Tracy. Hey. <laughs> so I had a question, but I wanted to make a comment. When you said who knew, I've known her. <laughs> I'm 60. I've known her all my life, and I didn't know. Oh. <laughs> but the importance of that is sit down with your family members and talk to them and get that historical reference, either in writing or a tape, before it's too late. My question was, people have sacrificed their lives mm -hmm. in prison. People have died. People have had their names and their reputation tarnished. Was there ever any regret that you have, not that you joined, but that you would have done something differently? No. I didn't have to. <laughs> That's why I said that you would have done it differently. Because I know you didn't have regrets about joining. Right. No, not one thing. At that time, uh, it was the most exciting thing I've ever uh, been involved in. It was uh, just amazing. And that part of me still exists. I can't separate that time from me today and it formed uh, the character that I have become so no I would not have uh, done it any different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> any other questions anyone else? Can I get one more? Oh yeah absolutely yeah. I'm, I'm greedy sorry this is my very <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> um, So one of the most important things you said was that the party got you know a 10 point plan from Africa and Asia. Yes. Um, Immigration is a black issue. The media will have you believe it's at the border, but most people who come here actually look like everyone in this room. That's correct. And um, Stokely Carmichael is the Trinidadian brother who right. came up with the term Black Panther. That's right. Or just garbage Jamaican, mm -hmm. not the Mexican Canadian descent. Like put that to rest that there's some sort of division because oh you're a black immigrant, you're not really black. Kamala Harris's parents are Jamaican. You know, it's like, put that to rest in this room now. Like, we're literally just the difference between a point on the slave ship. Right? Like, oh, right. you get off here, you get off here. We're so, black yeah. people. Yeah. Absolutely. People of color. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yep, yeah, right ahead. The panther animal itself, the uh, 
panther who represents fearlessness and of course the color black and uh, it was uh, they liked it they were interested in uh, finding something that would represent how they felt and so they chose the black panther the animal to uh, Oh, yeah. okay. Where did all the great photographs come from? Oh, thank you. That, that's from me, yes. That's my dad over there. Right there. His name? Jeremiah Johnson, Reverend Jeremiah Johnson. That's my father who was a great inspiration and a support for everything that I did. Who's and that? then <laughs> the other ones are just phases of me that I vaguely remember being like that. But yeah, so I just thought, you know, that would be nice. Well, the rest, are these from your own yes, these are from uh, my scrapbook. And then some I researched here at work and thought that they would be uh, interesting uh, to share uh, with some of you people because, you know, the image of the Black Panther is not just the guns and the force. It is community work and the respect and love for black people. And so they represent some of the things that we did um, as a group um, to help uh, serve that community. So you had a question? Yep. Um, I just wanted to clarify something. Somebody asked about where the Black Panther symbol came from. In 1965, there was an organization in Lowndes County, Alabama. Wow. Uh, they were black people. Uh, Lowndes County was predominantly black county, mm. but nobody in the county could vote. So they came together and formed their own political party. Wow. And they used as the symbol of, at the time, I think the Republican Party was using a chicken. So, so this, this organization decided to come up with a symbol because a lot of the people were not literate. Right. So when they, when they attempted to vote, they came up with a symbol, and their symbol was the Black Panther. Wow. So I think Huey, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale knew about them. I'm sure. And they, they decided to, 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 to borrow it, yeah. yes, because of what it represented. I heard that story, uh, not quite about where it was, but that they had seen it somewhere and uh, liked it, and so uh, used it for a representation for black power. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, any more uh, questions? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's have a few questions. Um, okay, go ahead. <laughs> by any chance, did you experience um, the relationship between the Black Panther and the Young Lords themselves? No. Um, even though they were the Young Lords, that's the group from New York. That's right. Yes, I, I am familiar with them. They came a little later. Uh, than when I was uh, participating and a member uh, of the party. But we knew about them, and they had the support of the black and Hispanic people of color. All those communities were supported by them, and we were aware of their work, and we, uh, we liked it. Thank you for reminding me. And also, um, what advice would you give your 16-year-old self <laughs> If I could give myself some advice, I wish I could have done more. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but you're in school and you're, you have a family, you have to go home, you know, you're still young and under the rules and provision of your parents. So I didn't have as much freedom as I would have liked to do more things. Uh, and if I was 16 and I had more freedom, even though I did take some days that my parents couldn't find me, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it would, it would be, you know, if I had more time, if I could have done more things, I would have advised to find a way. But as it was, I, I did what the best way I could do. <laughs> uh, any more questions? Um. So I think that this is a really, really, really important um, conversation to have, to have something as documented uh, as Tracy brought up earlier. Uh, if you have anybody in your family, older, that's still living, try to document what they say that happened in the past. I did that with my own uh, grandmother before she passed, and mm. I learned so many stories that would have been lost mm. if I had not asked her months before she died. That whole branch of our family would not have been dis discovered uh -huh. if I had not documented that, that stuff. And, I think it's really, really important to 
sort of document your own family history. I really do, especially as black people, because uh, a lot of it gets lost, and once people die, that's it. You don't. Uh, I remember my grandfather. He had a picture of his great great grandmother who was born in slavery, and I never got to ask him about her. Mm -hmm. And he passed away a few weeks later, and it's just been a brick wall. So uh, that's a little beside the point, but it's still I think it's really really important to document mm -hmm. important things in our history, the things that we do, our lineage, everything. I think it's very very important for us all to do that. So. All right. We thank you from the bottom of my so heart much. for coming. <laughs>